Greetings, Stars fans, guys and gals of all ages. This is Dallas Stars Game 10 against the Vancouver Canucks. As every video, we start off with predictions from the last video. Quinn, your predictions for Dallas, if they were to come on top, is going to be Dallas would win 3-0. If the Canucks were to come on top, you said four to two. That's a pretty good, accurate description of what the Canucks would have done if they had won that game. I said Dallas would win four to one, or if the Canucks were to win, I liked I liked that score of four to one. And going into that third period, I thought I was going to be dead on about that uh, prediction for. Vancouver. Yeah, but, it was a little bit of a rough game. Yeah, it it was another rough game. Well, it it's the second game in a row that we really see the Stars jump out and really put the throat put put their foot on the throat of the opponent just right from the jump because I believe up until like the 10 minute mark the Stars were out shooting and out chancing the Canucks. Like they, I think they outshot him like eight to zero within that that first ten minutes of the game. They had that one breakdown coming right off of uh, their uh, power play. You know, uh, who was it? Burrows that gets the breakaway, and Goligoski comes and slaps his hands. Which I mean. I mean, I don't even see how that was even a penalty, or a, a penalty shot, let alone. Well, when really you go didn't impede him any. When you go and look at post at the post game interview for Burroughs, he even said he didn't see how it was a penalty shot either, because he still felt like he got off a really good chance. I thought it was very generous that the refs gave them the he, they gave him the benefit of the doubt in. Giving yeah. him a penalty shot. Now, going into this game, I watched some pregame stuff. And what really caught me was the Daniel Sedin interview that they had. And he went and talked about last year's uh, big loss to the Stars. And he really... It, it, it sounded like he really kept that in the back of his mind going up against the Stars. It looked like he really wanted to come out and set a good game for this team. And you know what? After that 10-minute mark, they the Canucks woke up. I mean, this this Canucks team was the team to beat that beat uh, Montreal. That gave them their first loss when it looked like Montreal oh, was, yeah. just, was just going to go on a tear through the NHL. So that... Dallas needed to respect Vancouver because even though Dallas has had their number over the past like two, three years, ever since we got the acquisition of Gallardi, we've now won 11, 12 of 14 or it's 11 of 13, but now eight straight. Um, but going into the pregame stuff, I watched a lot. Uh, the Canucks coach, Willie, he comes from the Dallas system. He knows this system really well. And he went on and talked a lot about how he respects Dallas. He really enjoyed his time here. He loves the players that the Stars have. He's seen a lot of them come up through the ranks since he was the AHL coach here. But you know what? It was time that uh, he were to get a chance and it's good to see that he is still finding his way in the NHL with the Vancouver Canucks it looks like they're really kind of buying into a system he has a real strong system that really sets a good pace and he likes his teams to have a strong pace to where they cause a lot of havoc and a lot of turnovers which we saw again in this game for the Stars for I think what the third straight game that there maybe even fourth game that there have been double digit turnovers. We'll talk about okay. that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um 
what did you see with the defense in the first period? <laughs> uh, it's like you said, uh, lots of turnovers. Yeah. Um, you you continue to see uh, these little mistakes uh, done by our top line because they get too. I feel they get too overzealous on offense. So they try to keep the puck in when sometimes, you know, the, the smarter play is just to back off and let uh, just let them come to you. You're not always going to have Jamie Benn hustling back right. to, to cover you, as it showed as they got a lot of two-on-ones. Yeah, it, it that did show that they were pinching a lot. Um and it showed in the frustration of Ruff with him actually moving Klingberg away from Goligoski towards the middle of yep. the game. How how'd you uh what'd you think about that move? Did you think it really sparked um, anything? I feel like it, it kinda woke him up that uh they're the they're the top pair, but now you know, they're playing not the smartest of hockey, so Ruffs changed uh, the line pairs, and that seemed to wake him up and let him know that they need to act like the top pair defense. Now, did you feel it was just Klingberg, or did you feel Goligoski had a hand no, in it, it as it, well? it's both of them. Mm. It's both of them. And what did you think of Demir's return? Did you... Uh... Uh, it definitely added some more physical play to the, the defense... Yeah, that we, def that we I, definitely needed. I thought his return really helped kind of shore up the defense a little bit. It looked like they were a little more confident in their game because Demir's was back there. Because Demir's is a veteran that has has pretty much proven himself thus far in the season. I think Demir's has been one of the better defensemen that we've had, and it shows. Uh, and I think he's got really good vision. Like you said, he, he he's very physical. He likes to play the body. But he's also showing a side. I don't... Like, we didn't see a lot of him whenever he was with San Jose. Like, I, I, I hardly even remember Jason Demers in past seasons when we were playing against San Jose. That just... But him coming to Dallas... And this being his second season up into the start of the season, it really looks like he has he's he's gotten a lot of confidence in this system. And it looks like he's going to be he's he's going to have a little more of an offensive side to him. Not just his physicality. And it's it's nice that you don't have to rely on just Klingberg and Goligoski for your offense when it comes to defense as well, because you want oh, yeah. you want Oduya to to stay back. You want him to have that defensive minded positioning to him. So I don't mind Demir's going up just a little bit. I think it's 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 quite nice seeing him go up. Uh, let's see. Now the stars right now are. Eight and two. That marks the best start in this franchise's history. I mean, this is we knew going into this season that there are high expectations for this team. But did you did you really see them coming out to an eight and two start? Uh I mean, to be honest, I, I thought they were gonna be nine and one there for a little bit. Yeah, I mean... That, that, that Florida game kind of shook us up a little. Yeah, uh, the uh, the only game that was winnable, I think, was that Colorado game when they had that huge breakdown. But being 8-2, and two, I was more of the state of mind. I would have been happy if this team was like 6-4, and four, maybe two overtime or shootout losses so they'd be like six two and two i think that would have been a great start to the season but eight eight and two now is you know historic and 
it re it's really showing you that the hype is more than likely real about this team even though they still show defensive worries they're getting the I don't want to say above average goaltending but they are getting that average goaltending that this team needed to have last season and that's yep. I that's I think that's where it's really breaking down Niemi has really come in and has really put the stopgap in the system to where the stars can now focus on scoring instead of instead of the I mean the the stars focused on scoring last season but it wasn't a we need to score because that's the only way we're going to win this game you know the stars are now they they're able to focus on scoring but it's because they're allowed to score because their goalie is playing so great. Uh, I definitely agree. They're, they've definitely turned around their play, and it's definitely shown off. I just think they need to clean up this first period, and they'll be unstoppable. Yeah, it's, it's another game that the first period really comes and really just bites them in their ass and it takes it takes them longer in this game to realize what needed to be done because the stars just looked outplayed and outworked for damn like for i'd say 30 minutes maybe even 35 minutes of the game to where the stars weren't even in this game I mean, it goes to show in the stats that, I mean, they were outshot whenever they had such a strong such a strong start to the game. They were out shooting the Canucks. And then the Canucks wake up, and then they just start pelting Niemi with shots. They start rattling the bodies around. They start making the Stars turn over. They had 19 turnovers. I mean, three... <sighs> Three games ago against Florida, they had 20, and that score was 6-2. to two. Just because they have 19 turnovers and they win this game does not mean it's going to turn out a win every time. That's something that needs to be worked out, and if it needs to be discussed in their team meetings and what they're what do you what do you think they need to do with these turnovers and how or how do you think they they stop all the turnovers um you know some turnovers are just gonna happen but they just gotta be smarter with the puck don't always try to rush the play take your time take that little extra millisecond to look read the play and then make the make the right pass yeah it it does seem like the stars really start rushing everything when they don't need to like they get in like a panic mode to where they just need to calm down they just need to play smart simple hockey i mean when you think about this team it's not the most complex team all they have to do is go north and south protect the puck stop the puck i mean that's what hockey really is and i just think they are overthinking things. Key example with the turnovers. I'd say a lot of them came on their power play. And do you know which play on the power play that I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Whenever, obviously, they should have looked for a better pass than to Jason Dimmers. Well, it's, it's that... Stupid drop play that they seem to be in love with. You know, you know, I it it wor it works to an extent. I feel that that is a play for the first power play line only. It it only it only works. I I while I was it at only works when Spezza is the quarterback on okay, it. Okay, well. 
they need to find a way to implement something that works with either both units instead of having both units try to do that to do that move because they well, had they had Cody Eakin trying to do it on the on the second unit and it got turned over twice in a span of like 20 seconds exactly that's what i'm saying like i that's why i feel like but jason spezza didn't that should get be it. something he got it in the in the zone every time he, I guarantee he did. He did I not get it in. He did. he did not get it in every time. Yes, he did. It's, it's a play. The only time I saw them not get it in with the drop pass was whenever the second power play line was out. And I, for their second power play line, with Nachushkin, Hensky, and Ekin. That is not a line that should be doing that. They should be using their speed to skate it in or dump it in and chase. Well, no, I I completely agree that they need to dump and chase, but how they think this one play will work with both units, and it's not consistent even with the first line. Even if it looks consistent it's not it it gets messy they rely on luck a lot of the times especially whenever it gets jumbled up in the neutral zone not every time does it get in clean they might they might get in a majority of the times but it look but it's a lot based on luck and i think they need to go back to the drawing board i mean Yes, the Stars do have a top five power play right now, but I, I just think if they keep doing it, the teams are going to learn to scout this move and to really well, jumble. When you, when you look at it, there are a lot of NHL teams that do this, that this is their power play move. Yeah, and I don't understand it. I, I think that... that the way that their power play is now for the first line should stay the same, but they should change it for the second line. No, it needs it needs to change for the second line, definitely. Now, another thing you have you have the 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 players to make it work on the first line. You have Spezza, Sagan, Ben, Sharp. All of them have the hands to be able to to do this. What? What I would like to see is maybe give uh, Roussel a chance with the first first line unit, because we saw in this game a lot of Spezza's on the wall, Jamie Benz behind the goal line, Tyler Sagan is on the offside faceoff circle. And there's no one in front of the net until Sharp pinches down from the blue line trying to sneak into the slot. I would really like to see a dedicated person in front of the net on that first line unit. I think Roussel would really fit in and maybe put Sharp on the second line unit and have Spezza do his stuff on the blue line. I'd like to see that happen, but, you know, that's that's me. Yeah, I, I, I would see that working out more on the second line. Because mm. Jamie Ben is the dedicated in front of the net person. Yeah, but he's yeah, not... He's, but not, he's he, not always there. That's because he's, he's always looking for that pass to Sagan, which, I mean, yeah, it's great if you get it there, but I feel Ben's main role should just be staying in front of the net. No, I, I agree. I think he needs to be the body in front of the net and to cause that traffic that you need to really take the eyes away from the goalie. Um, let's talk about... Now, Were you, a, you were able to watch the game on television, right? Uh, I watched it on Game Center. Well, I mean, but... I mean, you had... You were able to watch the game from a... from a TV station. Yeah. What what did the game's attendance look like? I mean honestly, like I'm not I, I wasn't paying attention to that. 
Okay. Well, if you go on ESPN and you look at like the game recap and the game stats, it says that the Stars game last night was at a 95% full. I honestly that that might just be ticket sales or something because quite frankly I there's no way that building was 95% full for a team Man, it sounded like 95% when they won. Oh well, yeah, of course because you know you have horns blaring, you know you have music playing. Whenever the stars went down 2 to 1, I mean or and especially when they went down uh 3 to 1, that building just gets so quiet that for a team that is on such a great start to the season, you would think that they would have more people there. Granted, it is hockey. Granted, it, we are in Texas. I get that. But Dallas is a team that appreciates winning. We see that with what was going on with the Texas Rangers this season is that a lot of people weren't showing up to the games because they weren't winning. Dallas is one of the biggest bandwagon cities and that they show up for winners. And I just don't understand how the building could have been so empty last night the way it was. And it was it was a Thursday night game. I mean, I don't know. Just because it could be that the Mavs games was uh, being televised as well. That could have something to do with it. But, man, the crowd really needs to start turning up for this team because the Stars are putting on a great show. So I would like to see that attendance really actually get boosted. <laughs> what did you think of the, the Nickelback Mania that was being played through the uh. game? Well, I could tell you a lot of a lot of redditors were wondering why uh, Nickelback was being played by Grooves. Yeah, uh, or Grubs, or however you say his name. It's Grooves. Um, it it was one of the best th- because at first, at first I thought they would do like maybe like a couple of song or he would do a couple of songs, and then we'd be over it but he just let that thing just keep playing and he drug that through the dirt he let that thing play out through the whole second period and it was one of the best trolls you could see in sports it was quite amazing to see the reaction because i even at first was like okay this is enough nickelback and i was getting not irritated but i was like oh jesus but then i started to remember i was like oh this is grooves and he's known for doing stuff like this and you know what the dallas stars are recognized as having one of the best media teams in the league so when you understood that fans need to realize that it's all in fun so if something like that starts happening, just know that it's f- for a reason. I thought it was all in good fun. I went and looked at a lot of the responses uh, about it. I just thought it was hilarious because, I mean, I was one of those people at first that didn't really understand, but then I took it in stride. So yeah. it, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was it was amazing to watch and listen to. Let's I do talk. want to mention the uh, the whole uh, commentator jinx, though. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, what was said was uh, Dave Strader had mentioned that there had been six penalty shots the entire time of the season, and not one has been scored yet. Mm. And then Razor follows up with, and it's Burroughs, who has not scored on an entire on a penalty shot in his entire career. As it, soon as that was said, I looked right to the Reddit thread, 
and you could see the comments blowing up with why would you say that how could you say that guys yeah i mean it's and of it's, course they scored it's just like when someone mentions a shutout or a no hitter it always goes away so yeah i'd like to get that cleaned up because i mean their job is to provide information and stuff like that but how about we let that information come out after the shot is done Right. Yeah. Now I was at the game, so I didn't get to hear that. But I remember you uh, sending me a text message saying that they had went on and said that. So I was like, "Oh, geez." So let's let's have that information come out after the shot. You know, like let's let's actually not put a jinx on it. So now Patrick Sharp now has three goals in two games. Does this trend continue now that he has popped his goal scoring? Do you think the trend continues, or does this now start tapering out? I hope so. Oh! Almost got a repeat from last night. No, I... Or, I mean, I know you say that you hope so, but, I mean... I mean, you, you never, you can never tell. It's like, what were we talking about? Uh, we played a couple of extra games after last video when we were talking about Chase on, about how hot he was for, like, the first 30 games, and then he just disappeared for, like, the next, like, three seasons. Right. But, I mean, Patrick Sharp is one of those established scores so i hope the trend continues now that it seems the dams have bursted on on his goal scoring what did you think of uh, the th our first taste of the 3 on 3 uh, i mean it seems like it'll be pretty much a gong show for teams that have that super offense yeah, I uh, I was listening to the post game stuff, and Ruff Lindy Ruff had went on and said that he's only going to be playing three defensemen, and that would be our offensive defensemen. So you're only going to see Goligoski, you're only going to see uh, Klingberg, and. Did you did you see any other defensemen out there besides Goligoski and Klingberg? Uh, I'm not sure who the third one would Demers, be. I would I was about I, to say it could be. be I was thinking it was going to be Demir's, but how did how did you think it played out? I mean, yes, we got the win, but let's just say my my butthole was clinched the entire time. Yeah, even though it looked like the stars had the established momentum throughout that entire period one loose shot one missed shot one blocked shot and everything changes i i kind of like the three on three but it's yeah, like you said it's a we we have a small serving size and that was the first one i had seen since i had not really watched any other uh teams really do it but i do know that it's going to be all about offense and just pray for luck because if you don't have that elite offense it seems like it seemed like the Canucks really went into defensive mode especially whenever Jamie got his goal you could see them just start crashing around the net just hoping and praying that Miller would come up with uh, the saves so yeah, I think I saw the Sedin. I, I think I saw them out there once. Yeah. Now before that goal, Lindy Ruff had even said that they were that he was about to put Yamark and Nichushkin out there. How do you think about that pairing out there for a overtime pairing? Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. With with both of them being really really fast on skates, like. But they're. I would hope that they would have. 
the responsibility to play a little bit somewhat defensively while still being offense. But, you know, you can never be too sure. Uh, yeah, I think Nachushkin just seems to be the wild card for the season. It, it, it really just seems like he's out there to really try to do whatever he can to do and just hopes that it works out. Uh, now, this, I think the play of the game was two minutes left in the game. Niemi comes up with a pad save on Verbata that keeps oh, the yeah. that keeps the game at three three. That was the play of the game. Forget Jamie Ben's OT winner. Yes, that was a spectacular. Uh, play, but without Niemi getting that half breakaway shot on Verbata, that game doesn't go to OT and we lose in regulation. So, with the Stars playing the San Jose Sharks tomorrow, Saturday, 2 p.m., what are your predictions? Oh, and what was your rating for? the Canucks game? Uh, I'd probably say probably a, a B minus. I wrote down B. I, uh, I didn't like... I mean, it's hard to give a C rating for a team that wins the game when they show that enough fight to actually come back into the game. It's hard to give a C. That game would have been a C or a D if the Stars fought all the way back and they lost in overtime or the shootout. But I gave it a B because they showed that fight and then they just dominated all of the overtime. So that's why I gave it a rating of B. What are your predictions for next game? Um... I think the Stars are going to pull out a win. I'm going to say it's going to be 3-2 to two if Niemi's in net. Niemi? Yeah. And, but if, if they put Kari in net, I feel it'll be 4-3. to three. Interesting. So you really think that they would go back to Lettinen? Even though, I mean, I, I know, know. He, just, he's I been on know. the bench for I'm a while, rough. but I would hope I would hope that they put him in to get him some more playing time, get that confidence boost from being pulled in the Florida game. But I mean, it you never know. Yeah, I'm gonna go. If Dallas wins, I'm gonna go with a score of five to three for Dallas and if the Sharks win I'm going to say the score will be three to two all right so that has been the discussion be sure to like comment subscribe share on anything in the comments let us know what you want us to talk about what we got wrong, what you agree, what you disagree with. And till next time, we'll see you again.